Hello, this is Mike Regan, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to another On the Record with our longtime friend, Gary Schilling. There's a reason why we keep coming back to the well. We've been talking to Gary in these semi-annual forecasts for the last 10 years. I could take a bunch of time reading all the awards he's won and all the publications he's appeared in. Uh, I've been a longtime reader of his uh, newsletter, Insights, which is a fabulous, fabulous newsletter. You ought to check out because he shares some things that you're not going to see other places. And the reason for that is he tracks a lot of variables and has consistently rendered some pretty sound advice. So with that great introduction, Gary, I'd like to welcome you to yet another On the Record, uh, where we're going to take a look at what the heck is going on with the economy. Okay, Mike. Well, Jerry, let's let's jump right in uh, <laughs> as we're shooting this video here. Uh, yesterday, the, they came out with the... Uh, inflationary numbers, uh, they were not good. I think it was 9.1%. And uh, this interview could not be more timely. You're gonna basically be, uh, we wanna basically send out Xanax to folks, uh, perhaps after listening to this, so they'll get there. But help us understand what the heck is going on. Well, we've had a combination of things. You had supply chain disruptions, uh, frictions reopening the economy. And then, of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, now, you have to be careful uh, about these in, in inflation numbers. Uh, you're absolutely right. Year over year, the CPI was up 9.1%. But if you look at the month over month numbers, uh, they are much lower. And, we, and, and in other words, the 12 months comparison picks up an awful lot of what was what's going on in the earlier of those 12 months. Uh, but, but, but I think we, we probably have reached the peak of inflation. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is you're simply destroying demand. Uh, consumer uh, spending in real inflation adjusted terms is declining. Consumer hourly wages in real terms are, are declining. Uh, consumer confidence is virtually collapsed. And consumers account for two thirds of the economy. Uh, so if you have if you have consumers uh, withdrawing, you don't have the demand, and there's nothing to bring down inflation like a lack of demand. Another area that we've talked about extensively over the years, Mike, as you call this housing, and we've we we we've, we've had a housing bubble. It's, it hasn't been anything like the subprime uh, bonanza we had a decade ago. But there's been a lot of strength, and it's amazing. Uh, affordability of housing is just is just ridiculous. Very few people can afford a house anymore. It's less affordable than it was at the peak of the subprime uh, mortgage bonanza, and yet people have been rushing in. I I, I think it's a feed, been a feeding frenzy. But uh, housing, you're you're starting to see mortgage applications declining, and and uh, uh, housing uh, sales are declining. And I mentioned that because housing is a small sector. It's only about 2 or 3% of GDP, but it is so volatile that it can swing uh, two percentage points of GDP. And the average in recession decline is 2.5%. In other words, you can get, you can get a, a recession just out of a collapse in housing. So I, I point that out in particular. But you've got housing. You've got consumers weak. Uh, you look at small business. Uh, the National Federation of Independent Business, their, their confidence index has, has taken a nosedive. And of course, you got the Fed. The Fed has uh, been raising interest rates. And the history of that is when the Fed goes on an interest rate raising campaign, almost always you get a recession to follow. Uh, and, and you have some other technical things. One is called an inverted yield curve. And that's when the Fed pushes up short rates uh, they go up faster than long rates, and the two-year Treasury note uh, compared to the ten-year Treasury note, which is the one that I look at, and a lot of people look at, has has inverted. In other words, two-year yields are higher than 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 ten-year yields. Uh, there's there's and and of course stocks. You know, stocks are a very consistent forerunner of recessions, and stock markets started to decline really in the beginning of the year. January third was the peak. Uh, so you've got a lot of evidence of, of a recession, and uh, and and I, I I think you know you you don't have a lot of acceptance of this yet. Of course, most for, forecasters are paid to be bullish. Uh, if you want to buck the trend and be bearish, 
uh, it can be bad for job security. And I know that myself, as, as you'll recall, <laughs> I was fired twice by Don Regan, CEO of Merrill Lynch, for being negative on the economy. Well, the fact that I was correct had nothing to do with it. Uh, but, but the point is that uh, if, you, if you look around, I mean, I started talking about recession at the beginning of the year. And now, of course, it's become the topic du jour. But uh, if we're not in one, we're, we're close to one. And I think the, uh, the advice to anybody is to, is to really knuckle down, conserve cash. Uh, you know, cash is king. If you're running a business, boy, liquidity is very important because all those generous lenders suddenly get very ungenerous when times get tough and cash can disappear. Uh, cash flow can go negative uh, in, a, in a tremendous hurry. Okay, so Gary, you know, I, I kind of been phoning up for the interview here. Uh, I love to read anyway, but I guess the technical definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining GDP? No, no, that's not. That's a shorthand uh, version. Uh, well, recession attention issues. That's that's the version no, I always focus. No. Recessions <laughs> are designated by a private organization called the National Bureau of Economic Research. Uh, NBER studied recessions very extensively back in the 1930s, obviously after the Great Depression. That was a topic of considerable interest. And they're the guys who established the timing. No administration in Washington would ever want to be declaring recessions. Oh, no, no, no. So they leave that to NBER. Now, what does NBER do? They look at all the data and, and they declare the peaks and troughs. The problem is that with all the late reporting of data and revisions, it's oftentimes the economy has reached the bottom by the time they declare the top. Uh, so, so it's it's nice to know officially when you're in recession or not, but but from a practical business standpoint, uh, you, you really can't rely on that. You you need to look around, and that's why I mentioned some of these indicators: what the Fed is doing, uh, what's happening to confidence, uh, what's happening to stocks. Uh, these are the things you have to look at because you and I operate in 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 real in real time. We're not in an academic uh, bubble where we can say, okay. If we look back over 100 years, what was the pattern after all the data is in and all the smoke cleared? Okay, so having said that, Gary, and like I said, I always look for the Cliff Notes version. So my two consecutive GDP, is it your consensus that we are in a recession now? I don't know if we are or not, if, but if, if we aren't, we're very close. Uh, and and uh, uh, again, you know, recessions, Recessions ultimately are a decline in, in GDP. GDP, gross domestic product, is the sum of all goods and services produced in the economy. And, and, and we tend to look at it in real terms, meaning inflation adjusted. And when that shows consistent declines, uh, you can say that the peak of the economy has, has passed. But again, it's the NBER that basically makes the call, and everybody accepts that. Okay, well, so I, 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 if we're not there, we're, we're close enough for government work. <laughs> <laughs> and in a practical sense, uh, I, I think it's uh, any, anybody who says there's no recession out there in the cards, uh, well, good luck. <laughs> okay, good so luck. I'm, I'm going to, Gary, impose uh, on our friendship there. And I'm going to say that Gary has said that uh, while we may not officially be in a recession, we're real close and likely to end up there pretty soon yeah. yeah okay yeah so i'll allow you to add your bets so let's let's talk about something else i i uh was a lot younger back 40 years ago but uh you know i remember the carter years and the issue of stagflation yeah and so yeah. you know one of the things that i think a lot of people especially you know i've got kids in their 30s and etc you know they're, they're going to get a painful lesson about uh you know inflationary pressures in a recessionary environment can you speak to that issue yeah, yeah there's been a lot of there's been a lot of talk about this so-called stagflation now that existed in the late 60s and the 1970s the circumstances were that there was very heavy government spending on top of a fully employed economy 
where was the spending? It was on great society programs and on the Vietnam War. And, and uh, at that time, the Federal Reserve was very reluctant to blow the whistle on this. So you had, you had inflation because of too much demand, excess demand, and you didn't have the Fed uh, in there reducing supply. The result was, was inflation. At the same time, it was, it was slow growth because the economy is being so disrupted by, by these uh, cross currents, uh, Vietnam, all the protests, you remember, uh, the post-war babies were just entering the labor force. They were, their productivity is very low. They were new in the job. A lot of them hated to work. Uh, uh, you had a very different environment than you have now. <laughs> and you and I can remember that, Mike. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, and, and, and one thing you didn't have, and I think this is a very, very important one, you didn't have globalization. Now, globalization really started in the 1970s the way I define it, is really the transfer of Western technology to the Orient and applying it with cheap labor. And of course, that's, that's what made the tremendous growth of China and other Asian countries. And, and a lot of their output was exported to the West. Uh, now that, that situation has been going on, really started in the late seventies, but it, it, it was after the stagflation issue. And, it's, and it, to me, is a key reason that I don't think we're going to have high inflation in the longer run. You just have an excess of supply over demand. When you have more supply than demand, what happens to prices? They go down. It, it's a savings glut is another way of looking at it. In other words, the, the, the uh, people in Asia are big producers, weak consumers, so they have big saving. They're not spending enough uh, to absorb their what they produce. And, and now, of course, if we had all our protectionism, if you basically cut off imports at the border, uh, you, you, could, you could create great inflation of excess demand and, and, and you wouldn't have supply from Asia. But I don't think that's the case. Biden mm -hmm. certainly is not nearly as vehement on cutting back on Chinese uh, imports than uh, Trump was. And anyway, production is shifting out of China. Uh, it's shifting to much cheaper locales. Vietnam has been a huge winner. But you look at Bangladesh, Thailand, Malaysia, and the 800-pound gorilla in the room is China. If they ever get their act together, they're going to way outproduce uh, China as a, as a source of production. Another important thing is that, is that uh, what do you export? You basically export goods. You can't export services. In other words, if, if we have legal work, done in India, which a lot of law firms do because they're a lot cheaper, uh, that's an export uh, or an import rather, in this case, U.S. import. But most of it, what we're talking about is in goods. And what happens is as economies grow, uh, people spend less of their proportionally on goods and more on services. Now, how many cars do you own, Mike? Uh, a couple. <laughs> okay. But as you get wealthier, your driveway only takes so many cars. I well, you can that limit. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I, have, I have two. I got, I, got, I got one for my, that I use pretty much exclusively for my, for my honeybees and one to work. And then my wife's got, got a Lexus. But, but, you know, the point is there, there's only so much you can spend on goods, but services, you can spend infinite of money on travel, recreation, medical services. And that's what happens as economies develop. And it's true in China. Uh, much lower income than in the U.S. It's simply a, a, a course of things, and so you have more uh, you have more demand for services than goods, and that's another thing that that uh, takes the heat off of of the uh, of of, uh, of the of the trade situation. Okay, so let me go back and uh, just you, you mentioned you know the issue with Biden versus Trump with uh, you know, Biden being more, uh, not nearly as aggressive as imposing tariffs and that type of thing on, on foreign trade. Right. It, okay, and so let, let me just back up a second here and get to something that is, you know, you, with this whole transition, uh, Larry Kudlow yesterday was saying that the Fed's gonna have to raise, you know, interest rates by 100 basis points or 1%. Is that something that you foresee coming up here? 
it, 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 it certainly is possible. Uh, the Fed is behind the curve. Uh, if you want to use that analogy, uh, they were slow to recognize the burst of inflation. And I, I'm not sure you can really say they're a bunch of idiots because it did it did come on with a vengeance after after the pandemic. Uh, but in any event, they were they were slow to move on it, and uh, and as a result, they're but they are trying they're playing catch up. their credibility is at stake, and that's one of the reasons why I think they are going to continue to raise rates despite the the big decline in stocks and other signs of the economy dwindling. Uh, they've really got to reestablish their credibility. So, so uh, 100 basis points, yeah, it's possible. I, I, I don't know, but if you look at if you look at the yield on the 10-year Treasury note and say what does that imply for Fed funds? Uh, now they're now in the one and a half to 175 uh, basis point range. It implies they go to about four and a half percent. Now, whether that's in one one percentage point jumps, 100, 100 basis points, or whether it's uh, some 50s and 75s, hey, you know, I, I don't I don't know. But I, I think that's where we're going to go. And the Fed maybe even go above that simply to make sure everybody understands that they're out to kill inflation. OK, so let me see if I can unpack a little bit of this, because, you know, you brought up the issue of globalization which is a variable that's significantly different today than it was in the 70s. But one of the things we do have, Gary, coming here that's eerily similar, you, you mentioned government spending. You had the $1.8 trillion Build Back Better initiative. And you know I've talked to some people and they said, yeah, but not all of that money's been spent. You had that on top of the $2 trillion COVID relief package there. Yeah. Uh, and so <clears throat> I guess the, the, the question that is a little bit confusing to me, and if you could help clarify, would be help, really, really helpful. Uh, the dollar still remaining very strong. And is that, you know, in light of the globalization push, is that a sign, a canary in a coal mine type sign that economies around the world may be much weaker than we understand them to be? Yeah, well, you're, you're bringing up a couple of issues there. One is what happened to all the stimulus money from the federal government, three rounds of, of anti-COVID money, uh, and then the Federal Reserve uh, being very, very aggressive in, in pumping money out, uh, virtually dump, dumping it out of helicopters. But the interesting things is, and this is a results of surveys by New York Fed, uh, consumers saved about three quarters of the three rounds of, of stimulus and they save more with each round. Uh, people are scared. They have not spent the money. The saving rate remains high. Now, a lot of people say, oh, they're gonna spend it. Well, they haven't so far. And I, I, think, I think they probably are gonna, are gonna continue to, uh, to be cautious uh, because you know, the, the people are, you, you look at consumer confidence. I mean, people just are not enthusiastic at all about anything. Uh, now, in terms of the dollar, and uh, you know, in our aggressive portfolios, we are long the dollar. That's that's uh, that's been a major position of ours for over a year. And 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 the reason is because the U.S. is a safe haven. Uh, and of course, currencies are determined by what's happening in both trading partners. It's what's happening in the U.S. versus what's happening in Europe, for example. Uh, it isn't a monolithic determination. And 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 the U.S., you know, we may be the 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 uh, the, the the cleanest uh, dirty shirt in the laundry. We may be the uh, we may be the valedictorian in summer remedial school. <laughs> we may be the slowing fallest rock. We may be the, the tallest midget, but we're ahead of everybody else. Uh, so so uh, so the U.S. Uh, is really standing out. And of course, in Europe now, the euro, you know, the euro now is is back to one to one with a dollar. Actually, if you look back, the euro was founded in 19, beginning of 1999, and it sold off to 80, 88 cents on the dollar. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's strength in more recent years. Okay, but it's been all over the lot. But again, what's happening in Europe, uh, their economies are weak. And of course, they are looking 
Russia and Ukraine right in the teeth in terms of dependence on, on uh, grain and energy uh, from those countries. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and so, so you really have uh, that individual situations. Uh, Japan, you know, they, they, you know, every time I go to Japan, I, I, I come back thinking I understand less and less about how those people think. I mean, it's a very, very, it may be logical, but boy, is it different than the way we in the West view things. Uh, but the point is that they're, you know, they're perfectly, they're, it's a very uh, high income society. It's a very homogeneous population. And, you know, the, the populace is pretty well happy with very slow growth, virtually no growth uh, for 30 years. You know, it doesn't bother them <laughs> that much. Uh, they don't, they don't elect leaders that are going to do much about it. So you have these individual situations but you over overriding you have a safe haven aspect and where do people go uh internationally when they're worried they go to the dollar and they go to treasuries they go to treasury bonds and if you want to buy treasury bonds and you're a foreigner you got to buy dollars first you can't buy you can't buy a treasury with a euro or or a pound sterling you got to get a dollar to buy a treasury so uh you've got you've got all those factors which are keeping the dollar strong and say it's it's been it's been a, a real winner for us in our uh, portfolios we manage and i think it will continue to be okay so let me just uh as we kind of wind down here let's let's talk about you know something that we have periodically addressed and i know some of our listeners say these are where they really get the most value you know potential shocks to the system uh things which could take a recession and make it much more severe and extreme you know for example let's global conflict like russia ukraine uh i i there are those people that uh you know there are three ports in the ukraine that are responsible for exporting a lot of the stuff the largest one by a, a, a mile is effectively been shut down so you're seeing ukraine grain which also was like from what i've been told uh, a huge factor going into you know africa uh, and things like that. Uh, aside from Russia, Ukraine, but please touch on that. What are the things that have you most concerned that would go, uh oh, this is not good? You know, that, that type of moment. Yeah, well, sometimes these big shocks are visible. As you'll recall, we, we started worrying about the housing bubble with a subprime mortgage. A bonanza actually in the early 2000s and followed it up and it finally broke in, in 2007. And that was just so obvious when people who couldn't afford chicken coops were buying McMansions all on borrowed money. Uh, there's nothing around at the moment that is clearly visible like that. But, but we've had so much cheap money really since 2008, started with the Federal Reserve reaction to the financial crisis that year. Uh, we've had so much uh, money pumped out there and, and by the stimulus rounds we talked about a little earlier that you, you really, you really got to assume that there's a lot of speculation that is, is going to come unglued. Now we've seen some of that. Uh, we've seen some of that with these cryptocurrencies, uh, stable coins, you know, they supposedly are linked to the dollar and it turns out that uh, that that they really weren't. They were linked linked to other derivatives, and you've had some firms that have collapsed. Bit Bitcoin, which I think ultimately may be revealed as a Ponzi scheme, because uh, nobody knows who created it. Uh, it's all a big black box. Wonderful, uh, you know. It's had a nosedive. So so there's a, a a lot of that now. Now is that enough to really sink the ship? Uh, there's no question. We're getting a huge huge decline in all those kinds of speculations. But is that enough to really sink the ship the way that subprime mortgage collapse was? Uh, it's, it's hard to tell at this point, but, but I, I think that it's, it's in financial excesses. It's excess borrowing, uh, which is the result of freely available and very cheap credit uh, that, that is the risk. Okay, uh, you, know, you, you wrote a great book called Deleveraging. Uh, you know, and, and talked about the fact that, you know, and this is the value, Gary, friend to friend, that uh, perhaps our listeners can catch up on, uh, you know, the fact that we've done these for so many years, 
you were the one, I think, going back to 2015, 2014, that said, this is going to take years to unwind. Yeah. Yeah. And are, are we towards the end of that unwind cycle? Uh, yeah. And I think we're going to see a, a big leg down as a result of this, this recession that we're going to see revealed a, a lot of financial leverage. Um, and financial leverage basically it means heavy borrowing. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot of that unwound and uh, people will get religion. <laughs> cash is king. Uh, having good cash flow. Uh, I think we're going to see I think we're going to see uh, another leg down on the deleveraging. When you say leg down, what do you mean? Liquidation, um, people pulling in their horns, forced liquidation. You know, i give you an interesting example, Mike. Uh, if you look at if you look at used car sales yeah. and the loans, banks were lending 140 percent of the retail price of used cars. Well, that sounds ridiculous. But you remember, and this goes back a couple of years ago, that there was such a shortage of new cars that new that used cars in some cases were selling at higher prices than the equivalent new car. So they they 140 percent. They turn around today and try to sell those at auction, and they get 80 cents on the dollar. In other words, they lend it 140, yeah. and they can sell it uh, when they foreclose. And foreclosures are picking up. They've gone from 2% on, on the prime credits to 4% in the last few months. So, you know, there's, there's a case where you could see a lot of blood on the floor from, from auto loans and auto dealers. Well, you know, we're, we're seeing it in the class A truck market, you know, and, and you're seeing some stuff here where uh, we're seeing some anomalies in the transportation market. And, you know, Gary, you and I have addressed this over the years. You know, the there are a couple of markets which, from our perspective, are harbingers of things to come in the economy. One of them is packaging supplies, interestingly enough. Uh, the other one is transportation. And we've had something happen in the transportation marketplace, which is extraordinarily rare, which is that we have seen a significant decline in spot rates where the spot rates are actually lower than contract rates now. Yeah. And you're seeing some stuff happen in the ocean markets, <clears throat> which are there. Uh, one final final question that I, I even, I'm reluctant to bring up, but you know, we have been for years uh, beating the drum. Scenario planning is a very valuable exercise and the ability to ask the what if questions. And a lot of times people don't want to ask the what if questions because they don't want to contemplate the answers. But perhaps the biggest what if question here, and if you think I'm going astray, uh, just let me know and we'll delete it from the interview so no one sees it. <laughs> but what if China were to take a move on Taiwan? How would that be a game changer? Boy, that would that would be first of all, it would be uh, it would be extremely disruptive to trade, regardless of the response by the U.S. Uh, secondly, it it would uh, it would certainly bring us to a higher level of military uh, alertness. And and third, it could involve uh, Af Axel war with China. Now, we're, we're the history of war since World War II has been proxy wars. Uh, each side gets somebody else to do the fighting. Uh, we're using Ukraine uh, to fight the Russians. Uh, you know, and, and this is this is this is not unusual. Uh, the Russians were using Vietnam to fight us. Uh, so proxy wars are 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 the are the order of the day. So uh, I, I would think that uh, if, if China were to uh, get tough on Taiwan, uh, now they could overrun Taiwan and, and, and take it over uh, if they wanted to, but that would be so disruptive. I, I don't think these guys, they, they, and Chinese are, they're actually very conservative. They're very pragmatic, but if they did, and you're saying if they did, um, You'd have a very chaotic situation, whether it be World War Three or not. Hey, that's open to question, but it certainly would be a very, very disastrous for for rural trade. At the same time, at the same time, it would enhance the the trend that we've seen recently with all the supply chain disruptions of more pr more production uh, with cheap labor done closer to home. Mexico, I think, is a big 
is a big winner in this, uh, even though, you know, we certainly have certain problems with Mexico with drugs and immigration and so on and so forth. But these macchiadori, these, you know, pl the plants on the Mexican border uh, with the U.S. and so on, uh, that, that, that's an area that I think is already uh, going to gain with the supply chain disruptions. Uh, and if we had a problem of, of China with Taiwan, it would, it would certainly enhance that. Yeah, one of the one of the things <clears throat> we tried to caution people though. Uh, one of our friends is a gentleman by the name of Harry Moser that uh, created the Reshoring Institute uh, 12 years ago to basically talk about bringing jobs back home. Uh, I did an interview with uh, Jeff Wilkie, who up until he re went resigned from uh, Amazon uh, was the number two guy at Amazon. He was the CEO of global their global consumer area, and uh, did that interview in April. And, you know, one of the things that we were talking about is, A, replicating the infrastructure to produce the goods, it's not something you're going to do in the next 12 to 24 months. You know, that, that's going to take a significant amount of time. The other thing, Gary, he, I, 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 I would just throw this out, and I'm just kind of curious to this. You know, Chinese with their rare, min rare earth minerals policies and this type of thing, you know, 90% of our pharmaceutical supply chain, we've outsourced to China. Do you get worried looking at this from an economist perspective, economy perspective, do you get worried about what would happen if China said enough is enough? We're willing to live with pain. We don't think you are. Uh, that's certainly possible. And we had, we had that in World War II. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a good example was rubber. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, at that time, tires were not made of, of synthetics as much as it was natural rubber. And where the rubber come from? It came from Southeast Asia, and the Japanese overran that in World War II. And as a result, tires were very, very scarce. And that's one of the things that actually more than keeping your car running, it was how could, how could you run it without any tires? Uh, so you can see ex extreme disruptions because of those kinds of things now. What it does is in time, and this is the point, it does take time, you develop substitutes. Yeah. I mean, he, human ingenuity is always beat shortages every day and, and it will, but it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, but it, 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 it uh, you know, and I'm, Mike, you know, I'm no Pollyanna on this, but I mean, the history is that when you, when you run, when you have problems, uh, you develop, uh, you develop substitutes. I, I remember, I can remember when, Serious economists, grown men and women, said that the telecommunications uh, expansion was going to come to a grinding halt because there wasn't enough copper on the Earth's surface to make all the wires you needed. Well, guess what happened? Silicon. Silicon is second most abundant element on the Earth's surface, and that makes and that's and that's what you make uh, wires out of uh, fiber optics. Uh, so it's it's uh, you know it's you can get a lot of disruptions, but long term. Uh, the end of the world forecast is not a good bet. Gary, you know, just looking, one other thing that's obviously important to the supply chain would be the impact of uh, oil and, you know, the, the whole green energy thing. Russia cuts off Germany and, you know, we go back to coal and, yeah, can we afford green energy, all these things? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I find it uh, ridiculous and amusing. Uh, if you look at, at what Biden said when he came in, uh, he was going to cut out fossil fuels, stop drilling in the Gulf of Mexico and in Alaska for oil, uh, was going to uh, increase the mileage on cars, uh, move to green er energy. And he was not exactly charitable in the names that he called the leaders in Saudi Arabia. Well, where is I our, think the pariah? Does a, does, I yes. think that's not a good. Yeah, no, I think that's close. <laughs> but where is our beloved president now? He is going hot hat in hand to Saudi Arabia to beg them to increase production. Why? Because gasoline is something we all buy frequently enough that we notice the price changes. You know, when you buy a new water heater, when there's water on the floor, when the thing leaks, and that's maybe 10 years after you bought the previous one. You have no idea what you paid for it. But you remember what you paid for gasoline because you, you tank up uh, maybe once a week or more often. And that is politically very, very sensitive. Uh, so there is a lot of pressure there. Uh, now, uh, does that, is that going to result in more uh, 
production. Uh, we are actually, North America is now a net exporter of energy when you combine natural gas and oil and look at Canada, US and Mexico, we're, we're actually a net, net exporter. And, and, and uh, you may see uh, surprisingly from Biden, because he'd like to have the Democrats get elected in November, uh, you may see a lot more conciliatory attitude toward domestic oil production. Frackers have held back because uh, their, their lenders and their stockholders said, hey, uh, drilling is wonderful, but we'd like to see some profits. Uh, but uh, high enough prices uh, get anybody energized. Uh, so, you know what they say, uh, uh, the, best, the best fertilizer for crops is high prices. Uh, and it's true of anything else. So um, I think we're going to see increased production. And, and, uh, but but uh, prices are probably going to remain high as long as you have this conflict, because energy is now international. Uh, oil, you can ship anywhere in the world. And now with, with uh, uh, liquid uh, LNG, uh, you know, they compress it and they ship that anywhere in the world. So these are global markets. And if you've got the Russians cutting back, now the Russians don't want to cut back entirely. They need the money to support their economy. You know, and, and uh, you know, you talked about China. Are, are China really to take a lot of pain in order to, to go after us, and the same is true of China, yeah, or Russia, to a limited extent. Uh, but Russia needs the needs the uh, money they get from energy exports. So uh, they're 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 they, they want they're conflicted. They want to cause pain for the U.S. and Europe, but they don't want to cause a revolution in Russia. But the energy situation is probably going to remain tight, but it's going to it's going to work to the advantage of of producers of of domestic energy, and that even includes coal. And nuclear may come back, uh, and, and and we may see a lot more drilling uh, for uh, fracking. You know, if you could answer one thing though, and I'm going to get in trouble here, so spoiler alert to everyone on the line: Why is it okay to buy oil from Venezuela, <laughs> Iran? Uh, beg the Saudis to increase production but do things like cancel leases, discourage, you know, I saw something about the, uh, the funds going into fo you know, fossil fuel related stuff. A friend of mine that has about 120, you know, production capabilities there, wells, et cetera, was sharing with me a couple of months ago, just the change in environment in the last 18. Why is it okay to buy from other countries, but not produce it domestically? Can you help me solve? Yeah, probably. it's it's a, it's a it's a political decision. Yeah, let's face it, it's a political decision. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Biden and the Democrats have been very dependent on the on the green uh, lobby, if you will, and so they're really trying to get out of fossil fuels here. But when you need energy, and particularly when you need gasoline, uh, you got to get it somewhere. Well, Gary, you know, listen, as we wrap this up, I, I, I want to say thank you for your time. The, the folks here uh, will provide some information about how they can reach out to you to learn more through Insights, which is a monthly newsletter that, uh, that documents this. Is there anything that I've missed that you would like to bring out that they folks ought to be aware of, but maybe aren't necessarily thinking that far ahead? I think we covered an awful lot of ground here, Mike. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So on that happy note, listen, Gary, thank you for your time. And this is uh look forward to getting our next forecast. And so uh, this is, this has been very illuminating. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be of help, Mike.